Yeah. Yeah. How do you remember to bring back what you've learned? Oh, that's a good question. That's a that's an important question. That's a key question. Um, Roland Fisher, who was a great psychedelic researcher with psilocybin and later <clears throat> retired to Majorca to be Robert Graves' next-door neighbor, coined the phrase state-bounded. This means you can't bring it back. And I'm sure you all have had the experience of dreaming, being caught up in some incredible dream with strange people, foreign countries, exotic costuming. The alarm goes off. And as you stagger out of bed, this is just melting like an ice cube in a blast furnace. And by the time you're out of bed and fully dressed, you have nothing, not a shred, not a hint, not a clue. It's absolutely gone. This is a state-bounded memory. Chemically, what's going on is apparently short-term memory transcription is just not occurring. You're having the immediate impression of these things happening, and then it's not it's not going to disk, so to speak. It just is lost. Yeah? I'm, my experience is on the framing is to not to be afraid that I'm, I'm losing what I'm dreaming. You know, in the moment, I'm afraid that I'm not getting hold of. I have so many possibilities to memorize that I will memorize. So I'm, I'm not giving air to fear that I'm not memorizing what I'm doing. And the dream is not truly lost in that situation where you wake up and it melts away. And the proof of this, and I'm sure you all have had this experience, is then you go off about your daily business. And then there will be, and it was almost always by coincidence, a, an image, a chance phrase, a, a view of a street or something, and it will cause you to remember the dream. And once you get a hook into a portion of the dream, if you then work on it, you can probably bring a lot of it out. How this works in psychedelics is if I have an insight or something that I particularly want to remember, uh, first of all, I will say it aloud. This is strong imprinting. And then the real imprinting is to repeat it a few minutes later and then a few minutes later again. And if you can carry it over a number of minutes to several different levels, it won't leave you. A, a very useful shortcut for this is a tape recorder where if you play the tape of the trip back after the trip, you will certain just a phrase spoken will set off a chain of associative recall and you will retain it this way. But to my mind, this is um, one of what shamanic training must really be is mnemonic training. The, if you want to bring the stuff back, you have to train yourself to bring it back. N now, this state-bounded thing, it's important to notice. We talk about how dreams are state-bounded how psychedelic experiences are state-bounded, but what we fail to notice usually is that ordinary reality is state-bounded. I mean, if I were to uh, ask any one of you, what did you discuss with the person you had lunch with yesterday? It's probably very touch-and-go to actually put this together. I had lunch yesterday with Richard, we discussed his television transmission system, but that was new to me and therefore easy to retain. And also Richard and I haven't had thousands of hours of conversation together. But uh, the person we are most familiar with is ourselves. Well, it, I don't know if it works for you like this, but I am, let us say, cleaning my house, vacuuming, doing dishes, making beds, and I'm thinking all the time, thinking. And I understand why Rome fell. I realize what I said wrong to somebody two weeks ago. I recall a telephone obligation that I have to fulfill. I think about things that happened years and years ago. And then the doorbell rings and I go to the door and there's someone there and they say, what are you doing? And I say, nothing. This is because the ordinary state of consciousness is highly state-bounded. 
We don't... One thing these Buddhists have certainly gotten right is that attention to attention is the key to taking control of your mental life. And for most of it, it's just like a river flowing by. You know, and every once in a while we check to see if the river is still flowing by, but we don't uh, attempt to retain it. So uh, memory training is great psychedelic training. And of course, as I'm sure you know, there were arts of memory in the past. We are very poor memorizers because we rely on technologies to do it for us. But uh, people in the past had all kinds of technologies for allowing them to remember things. For instance, uh, the most common one in use in late antiquity and up through the Renaissance was uh, the memory palace approach. This is where you think of a place, a big place preferably, a place you know well, a school, a hospital, a cathedral, a university, but big, and sit and think about it. Think about how it looks as you go through the main doors and then what you see when you turn to the left and what you see when you turn to the right. Learn this building until you really can command it with reasonable vividness in most situations. Then, if you want to remember something, imagine yourself walking through the front door of this building, turning to your left, and there near the water fountain you will place an emblem of this thing you want to remember. And then you will go down the hall and around the corner and by the fire extinguishers you will place another emblem of the next thing you want to remember. Well then, the act of remembering this long list of things is the act of mentally moving through this imaginary building that you know. And when you come to the water fountain, the clue will be there. When you pass the fire extinguishers in your mind, the emblem you place there will be there. Now, I know this sounds highly unworkable and unwieldy, but it actually is extremely workable. And, and people like Catullus and Cicero, the great late Roman orators, were able to speak for hours on end uh, with lists of virtues and vices and interconnecting causes and this sort of thing because they were masters of this mnemonic m memory palace technique. Well, uh, psychedelics are a vivid... This is another one of these things like mantras, yantras, and so forth that works on psychedelics. You can do this. And so when you're on a psychedelic and you have an experience that you want to remember, place it in your memory palace. And the next time you come past that point in your memory palace, <laughs> this, uh, this thing will be there. Now, the other trick is, any of you who are interested in this, the last word is The Art of Memory by Frances Yates, which is a wonderful woman, great <laughs> scholar of Renaissance magic. And uh, the, the final trick is to make the, mem the image extremely vivid so that, for instance, if you're, if you're about to give a speech to your collegium on uh, the seven deadly sins, well, then one of these sins is lust. I chose the easy one because I can't remember what the other six are. <laughs> Shows you where my problem lies. So you don't, you don't just place the word lust in the memory keeping spot, you, you place some vivid and shocking image. Yeats suggests the image of a nun lifting her skirts. I think this was a classically suggested one that people were taught to use. Well then, when you come around the corner and meet the nun lifting her skirts, you think, aha, lust. That's the first, and then you go on and so forth. And books, some of the most astonishing products of the medieval engraver's art are these books of what are called emblemata. Emblemata are uh, surreal juxtapositions of things and animal parts and bodies and machines that are memory emblems made as grotesque, surreal, and bizarre 
as possible in order to make them unforgettable. That, that was the technique. And the surrealists used this very consciously. There is something about the unexpected, the grotesque, and the surprising that is, by, almost by definition, memorable. And this will work very well in the psychedelic state as well. If you 